Number 10, Madam X. We'll kick off this part two with a scandalous painting. Oh my, yes, shield your eyes, young ones. We got spaghetti straps coming in hot. This painting was deemed too scandalous back in the day. Madam X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avignon Gertreau, originally painted back in 1884 by John Singer Sargent. Now at first, John made the woman's straps sliding off her shoulder, a little, you know, a little, ooh, my lovely jewel strap is, ooh, slipped off, ooh. Apparently that was too scandalous for the upper class society around him back then, so John had to repaint the straps back on. Yeah, backlash was still so strong after John had sold the painting that he moved. The guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. Are you kidding? What have we done? Art, he's so good, and we pushed him away. Come paint me like one of your fine French gals. Paint all the straps on me, I don't care. On or off, what's up, let's party. Number nine, Hidden Beached Whale. Look closely at this 1641 landscape from Henrik van and Thonison. This masterpiece here is titled View of Skeveningen Sands. Yeah, it's a nice one. It's pretty cold of a day. I wouldn't go to the beach personally. Do you notice anything out of the ordinary in this painting? Anything at all catching your eye? What's everyone looking at here, you know? Art is so mysterious. So many questions in this one painting. I just, I feel like we're missing something here, you know? Like just something in this painting. What about now? Yeah, there was a beached whale in that painting the entire time, and we didn't know until 2014. How amazing is that? At some point after it had been completed, the work of art was painted over. So for hundreds of years, somebody was looking at this wondering what the meaning was. He's like, why are they all on the beach? What are they looking at? It was a beached whale this whole time. It was haunting the entire time to look at. Someone didn't like that. You know what, rightfully so. I would have painted over that whale too. No, I wouldn't have. That's a fabulous painting. I would have never touched that. Number eight, David and Goliath. We of course have to look at some of the artwork of the Sistine Chapel that's loaded with history fun history, some would say. A panel that shows David and Goliath specifically, or rather it shows David about to defeat the Goliath. Michelangelo added a hidden message in this one painting. The stance that David is making looks heroic. He's got, you know, athletic stance for sure to, you know, do some bad stuff right away. But his stance is in the shape of a Hebrew letter, the letter Gimel, which refers to reward and punishment. Good thing it wasn't Resh or else he wouldn't have won the battle. His arm would be all the way over here. He'd be like that. Wouldn't have won at all. These are like Easter eggs in famous paintings. So far, I'm loving this. And if you're enjoying the content as well, hit that thumbs up. Let us know, and then we can do more art for you. Let's move on. Number seven, hidden self-portrait. In George Surratt's painting of a woman powdering herself, there's a window in the top left corner. And me, personally, I would have gone with, you know, the sun. But George here, at first, he went with a self-portrait. A little selfie. This was odd behavior though, historically, for this artist because he wasn't known for painting self-portraits, ever. This was the only time it happened. Thanks to the Courtauld Gallery in London and a few x-rays, now we can make out the first draft of this 19th century painting. The portrait does resemble a photo of George as well. We compared them both, so we're definitely able to confirm that's him. He did at least one self-portrait. That's pretty historical. I'm, I'm glad we found it. X-rays were actually done back in 1958 and 1987, but the machine could only detect a layer of paint, not the actual image, if there was one. Pointillism is so impressive. I tried it one summer and was absolute garbage. Number six, Garden of Earthly Delights. This piece was done back in the late 15th century. Painter Hieronymus Bosch had a lot going on in this one, that's for sure. There's a group of naked people eating a big strawberry. There's a mermaid riding a fish. This one's got a lot of wacky stuff on it. We love it. In 2014, a hidden message was found on somebody's butt. Yeah, I'm not joking. There's actual like music notes drawn across somebody's bottom. Uh, so a college student translated it and now you can listen to it. You can listen to that guy's butt. That little melody Bosch was humming to himself while he was painting sounded like this. Yeah, well, it's not gonna be stuck in our heads anytime soon, but it's still fun to hear art come to life, you know? Number five, a starry night. We had Van Gogh in part one, Cafe Terrace at night, so naturally, we have to throw him in part two as well. The only time we've seen Vincent Van Gogh as a time traveler was in Doctor Who, but how did Vincent Van Gogh know about turbulent flow decades before scientists even knew about it? Yeah, that's the question we're trying to answer here on MA10. The Starry Night was painted back in 1889, but in 2004, NASA observed a distant star where dust and gas were swirling around the cosmos. It reminded NASA of Van Gogh's work, so they looked into his art a bit more, and mathematically, his artwork mirrors natural turbulence. This was also at a time where Van Gogh's mental health was not A-OK, -okay, so how he was able to get the math is accurate that long ago, and also via art, is mind-blowing. Number four, Bacchus. 
Michelangelo Caravaggio, okay. His 1595 painting, Bacchus, looks pretty calm at first. The god of wine and being a tipsy, a personal favorite god of mine, if I may. It's currently in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, and it wasn't until 2009 where, you guessed it, they found a hidden image. In the carob of wine on the bottom left of the painting, there is a self-portrait of Caravaggio. We can't see it with our eyes, but technology, once again, has our back here. There's a tiny little head reflected on the wine jug. Maybe, it just looks like a smudge at first, but with the help of radio diagnostic investigation, we can see the bigger slash smaller picture. We can see a man with his arms stretched out, the world's smallest selfie for the win. Number three, The Last Supper. We've all seen this one at some point, I'm confident. If you haven't, Look at this, isn't that amazing? I'm glad I was able to show you this. The Last Supper, painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the late 15th century, has been the talk of many towns. In this painting, we see John the Apostle, and it's been debated that it's actually Mary in disguise. I know, don't tell anyone. And that V-shape in between Jesus and John represents the female womb. That was in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. I didn't make that up. If I made that up, I wouldn't be here. That's crazy. But another secret could be lying in plain view this whole time right on the table. In 2007, an Italian musician found hidden musical notes in this painting. Musical notes hiding in bread rolls and in the hand of the apostles. We have two musical messages in this video, that's crazy. This makes me want to look for more clues in paintings. Let me just go look at some butts on art for a bit. Any notes on butts? What does that one say, it's an E minor? No. I'm gonna start looking at more musical notes on butts of all the paintings. I'm gonna try and find one. That one's kind of an E flat, you know? E flat. That's how we do it. Number two, separation of light from darkness. This one's another anatomical one. Makes me feel weird. Once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. I'm not gonna lie to you. The separation of light from darkness, Michelangelo again. Michelangelo was featured on part one, the creation of Adam. It's definitely an iconic piece. But once you see the hidden organs in that painting, it changes you for a bit, you know? This one as well, another iconic piece from Michelangelo seen in the Sistine Chapel. We have the central figure, God, surrounded by four others. What we often miss though is the spinal cord that runs up God's chest. It's like one of those hidden object books. Only the art is beautiful and the objects are gross. I'm like, oh, it's a spinal cord. That's found it. And finally, number one, the lady in the grass. We'll end this part two on another piece by Van Gogh. Patch of Grass was a Van Gogh classic done in 1887. And upon first glance, the painting appears to be, well, nothing more than just that, a patch of grass. But it's beautiful and it's art. So naturally, we'll look at it for too long. Oh, it's just a wall? That's not art. I thought it was the grass. That's just the wall. This one doesn't contain any deep space mathematics by any means, but in 2008, Dutch researchers used an x-ray, took a deeper look into the grass, and found the portrait of a woman. How haunting is that of a discovery? Imagine being the first person to find that. That's really scary. That's a horror movie. Around one third of Van Gogh's artwork has old paintings underneath it. He would often paint over his stuff. We're only recently finding them, which is exciting. Scientist George Deke of the Delft University of Technology, he's literally peeling back layers of paint history digitally. The painting right now hangs in the Dutch eastern city, Aturlo, in the Kroller Mueller Museum. So next time you take a look at this masterpiece, just know that there's a woman's face looking back at you. And while you're watching this video, just know I'm actually looking back at you right now too. Isn't that creepy? Art, digital art, still art. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have The Kingdom. This passage is one that comes from Matthew 7, 21 to 23, and it reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of thy Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Some people feel as though this passage is suggesting that there are people out there who believe themselves to be Christians, and people who are thinking that they are going to go to heaven or paradise when they die, but in reality, they don't know God at all, and he sees things very differently than they do. Definitely drives home the fact that not all good work lands people a spot in heaven. In our number nine spot today, we have the judgment of Solomon. When two women approached King Solomon with a question no one had any idea of what horrors were about to ensue. The women wanted to know which one of them was the mother of the baby, and the king had quite an interesting solution. First Kings 3.24 reads, And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Yeah, the king suggested that they just cut the baby in half and split it 
I mean, why didn't they think of that? Don't worry, no babies were harmed in this particular instance, as the true mother of the child was revealed when she sacrificed her life with the baby in order to save its life, while the other woman was on board with the whole slicing it in half thing. The passage finishes off by reading, The king gave his decision. Give the living baby to the first woman. No one is going to kill this baby. She is the real mother. The word got around, everyone in Israel's heard of the king's judgment. They were all in awe of the king, realizing that it was God's wisdom that enabled him to judge truly. In our number 8 spot today, we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. This story starts off when angels begin trying to visit Lot, who is a very devout and pious man. Things quickly go awry, however, as before they can enter his house, they are attacked by an angry mob from Sodom. Lot tries to save the angels, and to do this, he offers up his own daughters to the mob. I mean, like I mentioned, he's very devout, so I'm sure he means well, but if I was one of those daughters, I would have been pissed. Thankfully, the angels end up finding a different alternative. They instead blind the mob and the daughters are spared. The angels then lead Lot and Co away from the burning city. As they leave, however, Lot's wife looks back on her burning home just to get like one last glimpse. Can we really blame her? Well, apparently someone can, because when she looks back, she is immediately turned into a pillar of salt due to her apparent lack of faith. If you can believe this, that isn't even the craziest part of the story. But the next part is not written for YouTube guidelines, so there's not much of it that I can repeat. Let's just say that Lot and his daughters find a cave to hide out in, and they decide to uh, continue on the lineage. I'm not really sure what the lesson in this one is, to be honest. Don't look back as you're fleeing your home. Offer up your own daughter for sacrifice. I don't know, man. In our number seven spot today, we have Gabriel. So, in many of the texts, angels are like the messengers of God, but they also have their own powers and abilities that they can use as they see fit. In one particular story, Archangel Gabriel is sent to announce the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah, but when Gabriel does this, he gets a less than enthusiastic response from Zechariah. In fact, this response was one of protest, and Gabriel did not like that. He said, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you do not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Yeah, the guy didn't like being dismissed, so he just took away his ability to speak for a bit to teach him a lesson. I guess the lesson here is to listen to an angel if it appears to you and tells you that you're gonna have a kid? I'm not sure. At the end of the day, it's a bit of a dark way to deliver the good news. He's like, do you want the good news first or the bad news? In our number six spot today, we have John the Baptist. This tale starts off when King Herod had John the Baptist imprisoned after he spoke out against the king for divorcing and then remarrying his own brother's wife. While in jail, the king was throwing a huge party, and part of the entertainment was when the king's new stepdaughter was dancing for all the men. The king became completely enthralled with her. I know, I'm creeped out too, but he is so obsessed that he offers her anything that she wants. She has quite an unexpected answer, however, as her response is that she wants John the Baptist's head brought to her on a platter. The king doesn't really want to do this, but he also promised her anything she wished, and this was what she wanted. Thus, the beheading of John the Baptist took place, and she was served his head on a platter in front of the whole party. Imagine you're just like enjoying a nice charcuterie plate, some wine, enjoying the party, and then someone brings out a head on a platter. Yeah, terrible party, appetite fully ruined. John the Baptist, although he met a cruel fate, would later go on to be sainted. In our number five spot today, we have King Herod's fate. Back with another King Herod story, this time he is meeting his own fate, and man, it is truly not ideal. Basically, he shows up, he's doing some public speaking, and in doing so, he is challenged. Despite this challenge, he still refuses to acknowledge God as the one true God. If we know anything about that in the Bible, it usually does not end well for those who don't acknowledge this. This leads to Herod immediately being struck down by God. I mean, he wasn't just gonna stand for that, especially in front of a bunch of his followers, but that isn't just the average striking down. He didn't just die right there on the spot. Oh no, his fate had to be much worse than instant death. Instead, he likely wished that were the case, as he met his fate by slowly being eaten alive by worms from the inside out. Slow, agonizing, completely dreadful. This story truly is not for the faint of heart, but it serves as a great reminder for those who believe in the stories of the Bible. In our number four spot today, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These four entities are described as part of the prophecy by John in the book of Revelations. Many people take their story to mean that these horsemen are those who will bring the apocalypse and that they are the harbingers of the last judgment. It is said that pestilence or plague will ride in on a white horse, war on a red horse, and famine on a 
a black horse and death on a pale horse. The story in the Bible speaks of how a quarter of the earth's population will be killed by a combination of all of the horsemen. All in all, while these horsemen definitely have creepy descriptions, nothing is as creepy as the thought of them bringing the apocalypse with them. In our number 3 spot today we have Joram and the Mothers. For this one, I'll start with the passage and we can dive into what it all really means after. So 2 Kings 628-29 reads, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. If you didn't quite catch that, this passage tells the story of two starving women who agree agree to their own children in order to survive. Once they eat the first woman's child, the second woman doesn't hold up her end of the deal and instead hides her son to protect him. This story is clearly very gruesome and horrible, but many people believe its desperation and deceit shows not only the king but also the reader the severity of what people are going through when they are enduring an enemy siege. In our number 2 spot today we have Raphael. Raphael is one of the true archangels and he is the fourth oldest of the five. He is a powerful healer, a guardian angel, and a great fighter, but there is just one unsettling story in particular that I really want to talk about, and that story comes from the Book of Enoch. In this story, Raphael is in a battle with the demon Azazel. Raphael is able to defeat the demon, but decides to subject him to a fate worse than death. The story writes, bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert, which is in Duadel, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face that he may not see see light, and on the day of the great judgement he shall be cast into the fire. If that wasn't clear enough, Raphael tied this demon up, buried him alive in a hole full of rocks in the middle of the desert, where he now just gets to wait until he can be thrown into a fire and burned alive. I gotta say, that is very dark, but it has become abundantly clear, do not mess with an angel, okay? In our number one spot today, we have the nephews. Moses had two nephews named Nadab and Abihu, and their father Aaron was quite important to the priest community, and he was the only one who was meant to make sacrifices to God. These two, however, decided that they too should be good enough to burn an offering, but things did not go to plan for them. You know, no one can start feeling too good about themselves without some kind of consequence. We don't want anyone getting too big of an ego around here. When this happened, God decided to send a huge fire from heaven that completely engulfed both of the men and just fried them to ash on the spot. Right where they stood, they ended up completely charred and everyone learned a very valuable lesson that day it seems. Number 10. Pompeii Graffiti What do Romans and Zoomers have in common? Probably their love for weird and semi-unfunny memes. Yes, even thousands of years in the past, people were leaving all sorts of tasteful messages on the walls for all to see. Insults, compliments, but more interestingly, threats. Most of these are obviously jovial in nature, but there is one that does stand out as interesting. The message reads, to the one defecating here, beware of the curse. If you look down on this curse, may you have an angry Jupiter for an enemy. Seems silly enough, right? Well, it is, until you learn that it was found at Pompeii, the city buried by a volcano. Sounds like a fairly wrathful act, eh? Seems like Jupiter was being a bit of a party pooper. Number 9. Hans Holbein's The Ambassadors Hans Holbein is a classic artist, but one of his most famous works stands out as a grim omen. In 1533, Holbein would be commissioned to portray ambassadors Jean de Dinfy of France and Georges de Save of Lavour. This work is an excellent piece, but it includes an enigmatic secret, a strangely proportioned skull. There are numbers of theories as to why this was included, one of the most popular coming from Oscar Bachman and Pascal Grenier, who suggest that the skull is meant to contrast the beauty and value found within life against the grandeur of death. Holbein would pass almost exactly one decade later, which arguably completes the implication of this message in its entirety. Number 8. 
The Voyager Messages The Voyager Deep Space Program helped NASA further its understanding of the solar system with absolutely breathtaking images of the universe that were sent back to Earth. However, those messages weren't the only thing that the Voyagers were meant to carry. Inside each probe is a golden phonograph disc titled The Sounds of Earth, which includes several greetings, sounds of whales, a crying baby, waves on a shoreline, music from a scatterplot of important musicians from around the world, and greetings in around 55 different languages. While this seems like a friendly handshake from one part of the universe to another, the question must be asked, what will find this disc? What will they think of us? And what will they do next? The Voyagers are still out there, and they are expected to no longer be able to transmit anything to us in roughly around 2036. Which probably means that if anything does find them, we won't be getting a warning until they're here. Number 7. The Mayan Calendar Portents of doom are common enough in history. However, 2012 was an interesting year for such fears, as the turn of a new millennium caused a number of people to become absolutely certain that the world would end. To justify their claims, they looked to the past, and one message seemed to leave people more certain than others. Now, let's be clear, the Mayans didn't actually make this calendar. That would have to be attributed to the early Mesoamericans, who termed the end of a period as, of the time as the Bakhtun. Bakhtun 13 was the end of a particularly large period, and when lined up with our calendar, it matched up alongside the date of December 2012. So, was the message true? It was fun at the time, but after the date passed, the real horror was revealed as people admitted to selling their possessions and homes with the expectation that they just wouldn't need them anymore. All because of a calendar period ending in a way that most computer technicians would just describe as stack overflow. Like, your car doesn't explode when you max out the mileage counter, it just resets to zero. So the terror here was more that people actually believed this crap, just because the Mesoamericans didn't make a Bakhtun 14. Jeez. Number 6. Qin Shi Hong's Meteor so in 211 BC, the Qin Dynasty was in full swing and everyone was having a great time, suffering under the rule of their tyrannical overlord Qin Shi Hong. Suddenly, a meteor fell from the sky, landing in the province of Dongzhen. Upon inspection, the meteor was revealed to have been inscribed with the words, The first emperor will die, and his land will be divided. Whether or not this was an elaborate hoax or not, the Emperor was paranoid enough to demand that the writer come forward, and when no one did, he had everyone who lived in the area executed. The funny thing is, a year later it came true. Qin Shi Hong died, and while China remained somewhat unified, the Qin Dynasty fell only three years later. And soon after that, the Han Dynasty took over, ending the Qin's dynasty's short reign. Unfortunately, the meteor was shattered, so this brilliant moment has been permanently lost to time. Number 5. Egyptian Tomb Curses Ah, Egypt! One of the greatest civilizations known to mankind. Thank goodness that a bunch of Europeans decided to rob the graves of their ancestors or else they'd have been really bored or something. Uh, however, when these losers decided to pop open those tombs, likely searching for gold, they instead found a cavalcade of curses. Some of these read as such. Any ruler who shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may his heir not inherit. As for all men who shall enter my tomb, there will be judgment. I shall cast the fear of myself into him. And all who enter this tomb will make evil against it. May the crocodile be against them in the water, and the snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in water, and the scorpion on land. 
Aside from being incredibly cool and threatening, these grave robbers were also plagued with visions of ghosts, and many died, usually from disease carrying insects and violent animals. Huh, who could have seen that coming? Number 4 The Ring of Senesenius. This ring was discovered by a farmer plowing his land in 1785, but wouldn't be brought to archaeologists until years later. Made from 12 grams of gold, the ring contains an inscription in Latin which reads, Senesene vivus in Deum, which kind of translates to live in God, although the ring apparently has some spelling errors, so. Whatever, it doesn't matter. A tablet was discovered which was inscribed within a curse, claiming that whoever removed the ring would never again be in good health until it was returned to Nodens. The archaeologist who excavated the site decided to call upon a close friend to research the actual location of Nodens, a professor at Oxford named J.R.R. Tolkien. That's right, baby. This little curse inspired the Lord of the Rings. Number 3. The Serbian Skull Tower Signs are very effective means of ensuring through symbology that people can understand what they mean even without speaking the language of the people that they were made by. For instance, red is generally the color that is universally used to denote that everyone should stop. And skulls usually denote that everyone in the area should probably turn around and leave. There's no better example of this than the Skull Tower, located in Serbia. Apparently, in 1804, there was a Serbian uprising against the Ottomans, an uprising that failed in spectacular fashion. After their battle, the governor of the area decided that the easiest way to ensure no one tried it again was to create a tower out of the skulls of the rebels, sending a very clear message to anyone with seditious thoughts. Just try it. Number 2. The Czech Republic Warning Stones as the world is racked with an oncoming ecological disaster that you should be as terrified of as I am, artifacts have been uncovered which have revealed some fascinating messages. Prior to the invention of the internet, the residents of the area had the idea to inscribe messages on stones which would warn people of incoming disasters such as droughts, famines, bad harvests, food shortages, and just incoming hunger in general. This last part led to their being dubbed as the Czech Hunger Stones, with dates going back as far as 1417. Some quotes that can be found on these messages are deeply disturbing, such as, When you see me, weep. I guess the Morning Stones are doing their job pretty well this time around. Number 1. Charles Maffel's Final Message and Jeremiah Burke's Final Message Messages in bottles are some of those neat little things that are synonymous with the adventures of pirates and other seafaring individuals. These messages aren't exactly as whimsical. In 1909, the vessel Waratah set sail from South Africa to Australia, but went missing at sea. Numerous people attempted to claim that they'd received letters in bottles from drowned sailors, and while most were clearly fake, one did prove to be genuine, matching with the sailor's handwriting and the time with which he would have had to write it. The message reads, Top heavy, one side awash. Goodbye, mother and father. Signed, Charles McFell, Greaser. Several years later, a similar incident would occur with the sinking of the Titanic and the discovery of a letter sent from Jeremiah Burke, reading, From Titanic, Goodbye All, Burke of Glanmire, Cork. The message was written on a scrap of paper, then placed inside an empty bottle of holy water given to the man by his mother prior to the voyage. She died before she could read it. Kicking off the list at number 10, The Creation of Adam. We'll start this list off with one of the most famous paintings of sculptor and artist, Michelangelo. The Creation of Adam. You've seen it at one point or another, or you've seen it referenced at one point or another. It was painted back in 1508. The poster of E.T. was inspired by this painting. With little hands, little... Oh, found home. 
Memes have been on a whole new level thanks to Michelangelo in this piece. But what's the dark background here exactly? Perhaps the plethora of naked folks in the sky all bunched up together? Not exactly. It was known that back in the 1500s, Michelangelo used to dissect bodies, all in the name of art. Of course, why not? He would create anatomic artwork, that's why his creation of Adam kind of looks like he's crawling out of an organ. To be honest, I never noticed it at first, now, I can't unsee it. That's definitely the inside of a body. The Sistine Chapel has many dark pieces of art. I may or may not mention another. Number nine, Bill Clinton. We've all heard that clip downloading music growing up, you know. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Like, bro, I'm trying to listen to Christmas music. What is this? Whose voice is this? What did I download? Why is this computer not working anymore? I'm so grounded. Back in 2006, former US President Bill Clinton showed off this beautiful portrait of himself done by the incredible artist John Nelson Shanks. As far as portraits go, this is beautiful. The art is beautiful and all that. But that pose, I mean, I don't know. Something's, something's off about it. His stance is like, let me redo it. He just looks uncomfortable, you know? He doesn't look ready yet. Well, that's because the shadow on the left side of the portrait, it's meant to represent Monica Lewinsky. I'm not even lying to you. I knew it, I felt like there was some darkness in here. I'm like, oh, something's off here. There's some shady history around. Pun intended. The artist himself admitted that this was indeed the case. He used the dress shape as symbolism to the scandal while he was creating the artwork. I thought the dark background here was Bill's pants, but well, I was wrong, that's why we're here. We like to educate. Number eight. The Madonna with Saint Giovanni. For this next one, we'll be taking a look at a painting from the 15th century by artist Domenico Ghirlandio. This painting is currently in the Hall of Hercules in Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. Also, if I'm saying any of these names wrong, you can tell me. I'm, it's probably gonna be a lot of them. I'm trying. The painting shows the Virgin Mary, infant Jesus, of course, with a six pack, for some reason. And over her right shoulder, we can see this object floating in the sky. Let's take a closer look at that, shall we? What is that? Is that a drone? A magnetic balloon? A, a weather balloon? Those weren't around then. What's even more interesting is that a man is looking up at the sky at this object. He's even covering his eyes, shielding the sun to try and get a better look. Man's going blind to try and see what's hovering above him. It's always a good sign as well when your dog is barking at something next to you in the sky. Art historians believe that the object is an angel, an angel resembling a cloud, while others believe that it's a clear sign of alien visitors. I'm others. I'm like, oh, E.T., the whole thing. I'm, this is starting to make more sense now. What do you guys think? Was this the 15th century version of drawing the sun at the top corner of your painting? Or did this mystery artist just document UFO footage with his own brush? Number seven, Cafe Terrace at Night. Upon first glance, you can tell this is a piece done by the fabulous Vincent Van Gogh. The blue tones, the streaks. I did the Van Gogh experience downtown Toronto and it was mesmerizing, honestly. The floor is moving, I was like, falling into the walls and everything, it was great. While his 1888 oil painting, Cafe Terrace at Night, looks like a quiet late night summer dream, it's actually pretty dark when you start looking closely. I'm not a Van Gogh expert by any means, but Jared Baxter, he is. Back in 2015, Jared brought forth this idea that Cafe Terrace at Night was really Van Gogh's version of The Last Supper. This figure in the center with long hair and 12 surrounding individuals, one of which is slipping into darkness, Meh, it checks out. He also says there are hidden crucifixes in this painting. I knew there was something spiritual about that Van Gogh exhibit. I knew it all around me. I'm like, is that a floating crucifix? Where'd it go? It's gone. Number six, Medusa. Another one of the most recent paintings on today's list is Medusa by Caravaggio. It was done back in 1597. Crazy that that's a recent painting. That's so long ago in my head. And this photo, I'll admit right off the bat, is a little bit haunting. It's, yeah, it's a little gory, it's a little graphic. But where does this idea come from? What compels a person to spend this long on a scary painting? The entire time I'd be like, mm -hmm. We all know the story of Medusa, the woman with, you know, snakes for hair, when you look at them, you turn to stone and then you're stuck forever and it's horrible. Well, this is a painting that really captures her, her essence, her beauty, you know, really just, uh, her complexion is so nice, her snake complexion. The snakes really add to the moment, you know, without taking away. The blood oozing out of her neck also draws the eye, it's a nice, Oh, it's a nice accent. This painting was meant to be a depiction of the defeat of Medusa, obviously. The legend goes that Perseus, who is the son of Zeus and Danae, was given a shield by Athena. He took said shield to battle Medusa and he managed to outsmart her by letting her catch a glimpse of her own reflection in that shield. Bam, you played yourself. Yeah, she turned herself into stone and then this is when he took his sword out and you know, you can probably feel the rest of it. You've seen Game of Thrones. A happy moment, perhaps? I don't know. Imagine having this in your home. I wouldn't sleep. It's terrifying to look at. Number five, the Mona Lisa. No way she's on this list. What is she up to? How can the Mona Lisa possibly be on this dark messages list? She's literally just... 
She's chilling out, she's so calm. Another masterpiece from Da Vinci, coming from the 15th century. There's already been, of course, hundreds of theories surrounding this painting. Like perhaps she could have been pregnant, given her stance with the, you know, the hands doing the thing. And the veil over her shoulders, those were worn often by pregnant women during the Italian Renaissance. But back in 2011, a clue was found in the painting. Yeah, a clue, like we're national treasure all of a sudden. Silvano Vincetti supposedly found letters and numbers painted into her eyes. Teeny tiny microscopic numbers and letters. How fun is that? Yeah, I was at my desk earlier and my forehead was like touching my computer screen. I was like, really? Are you sure? I was looking, couldn't find anything. My eyes aren't that great. The L over her right eye stands for Leonardo and in the other eye, there's a 72, the number seven and two. We believe so far this relates to Christianity and Judaism. Seven, the creation of the world and two, the duality of men and women. Meanwhile, I'm over here drawing that really cool S. I think I nailed that, I'm not gonna lie. Number four, The Ambassadors. This one got me, I'm not gonna lie, I got the creeps after this. The Ambassadors is a painting from 1533. I've seen this one before, as I'm sure you have at one point or another. Hans Hobianth Jungers painted this lovely room with, you know, scholars, there's a globe, a mandolin, you know, to pass the time, help inspiration, as we all, that's why we get mandolins. We have one in the corner here at the studio. Chris whips it, often. But at the bottom, we see an anamorphic skull. It makes you want to cock your head around almost. It doesn't seem to fit in properly. Like the angle of the skull is wrong. It looks like whenever I try and use Photoshop, it's just something's off. Experts believe this was done intentionally to remind us that death is around the corner. So when I was looking at this, I was like, why is that doing that? And I'm like, oh, death is around the haunting. Next, number three, the old guitarist. Any fans of Game of Thrones on here? Well, this next one gives off major White Walker vibes. The old guitarist is, well, exactly what you think. It's an old man, hunched over, white hair, playing a guitar. This would be creepy regardless, just on its own. But when Pablo Picasso was putting together this masterpiece back in the early 1900s, he had some tricks up his sleeve. At the end of the 1900s, in 1998, researchers used infrared on the painting. Again, national treasure style for some reason. And this time, it wasn't a hidden message, it was a hidden woman. Yeah, another woman was painted underneath the elderly man. So because this paint is naturally fading now, she's becoming more and more clear to see. That is so deep. That's the most deep thing. Am I into art? Am I enjoying art? Am I researching? This is fun. I like this. Number two, Netherlandish proverbs. Back in 1559, Peter Bruegel the Elder, great name, created this oil painting and we're still trying to unravel everything in here. And this painting, I mean, for one, it's massive. There's a lot going on. It's on display currently in the Gamal the Gallery in Berlin. It's got a lot going on. And when you really start to focus, you can see some weird going on in this painting. What is that guy doing? That guy's banging his head off the wall. Walter White's been throwing pizzas on the roof for some reason. That fish ate a bigger fish. This dude fell off an ox onto a donkey. What kind of heist was going on in this town? What is happening? Ah, uh, I see. It's supposed to be horrible. Lovely. Proverbs were a hot topic back in the 1500s. Apparently, over 100 Dutch proverbs and idioms are seen in this painting. He also aimed to illustrate the stupidity of man, and given how much of a shit show this town looks like, I'd say Peter nailed it. And finally, number one, the Arnolfini portrait. This one is the most impressive paintings on our list. I am a sucker for reflections. And for this one, we'll be looking at Jan van Eck's painting from 1434. It's quite old, the oldest on our list. This is an oil painting titled the Arnolfini Portrait. It shows Giovanni de Nicolaio Arnolfini, his wife, and a little doggo. In the background, that's where things get mysterious. There's a mirror, a painted mirror. It's been widely believed that Jan is in the painting themselves. We love an artist cameo, nice. I'm actually in that wall too. Believe it or not, you just can't see me yet. It hasn't been long enough. Also, written in Latin above the mirror, there's a message. A Latin message. Let's do it. The message reads, Jan van Eck was here. 1434. That's gotta be the oldest blank was here of all time. Even older than Brooks was here from Shawshank Redemption. That was pretty old. A message like that with the artist hidden in the painting, that gives me goosebumps all around. And I'm not really entirely sure why. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have KV55. This is a tomb that is referred to by a number rather than a name because we don't actually know who lies inside of this tomb. While this tomb had its modern discovery in 1907, we still haven't quite found the answers surrounding this mystery. To make things a little more eerie, while the walls of the actual tomb are bare, which is bizarre, as you walk down the steps towards the tomb, you'll notice that there are some markings leading up to it. You'll see inscribed on the wall of the entrance the words which can be translated to, quote, the evil one shall not 
live again. If this wasn't enough to give an unsettling feeling, the coffin inside of the tomb has been desecrated, with part of the face having been removed. So all in all, we don't know a lot about what's going on down there. But it doesn't seem good. In our number 9 spot today we have the Ancient Curse. For this one, we have a good old fashioned curse that was unleashed from the inside of a tomb. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there really was a curse found on the inside of this tomb. The tomb of Ankhmahor, who was a pharaoh's official who is thought to have lived around 4,000 years ago during Egypt's 6th dynasty, was an above ground tomb that was shaped like a rectangular box. Inside of the tomb, they found a curse inscribed that warned anyone who dared to disturb it. The curse roughly translated states that anything a trespasser quote might do against this my tomb the same shall be done to your property it then goes on to warn the trespasser of his knowledge of spells and secret magic and it threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing ghosts these kinds of curses have been found in other tombs and while they certainly are nothing like the ones depicted in horror movies about mummies it still might be a little unnerving to those unearthing this discovery in our number 8 spot today we have chapter 17. Archaeologists had a large and very exciting discovery as the 4,200 year old funerary temple of Queen Neret, who is the wife of Pharaoh Teddy, was found. The recently excavated Saqqara necropolis was stocked full of incredible treasures. Inside there were over 50 wooden sarcophagi, there was a board game, a riverboat with rowers, statues, wooden masks, a shrine dedicated to the god of the dead, Anubis, and there was a burial sanctuary dedicated to the queen. And while all of these finds are truly unbelievable, one of the most fascinating to researchers was a scroll from the Book of the Dead. The 13 foot long papyrus scroll, which was referred to as chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead, acts as a chilling guide to the afterlife. In our number 7 spot today we have Skara Bray. This is an area that is located in Scotland and it was found in an exceptionally surprising way. In 1850 there was a huge storm that hit Scotland. Scotland, and it was so bad that around 200 people passed away from it. The next day, however, once the storm had passed, residents of the Orkney Isles began to notice that a part of a cliff had dislodged, but it uncovered a sort of hidden settlement. Tests were able to date this site back from 3200 BC to 2200 BC, and it was shown to have been inhabited for about 600 years. There were round stone homes here, and the roofs were made out of whalebone and peat. The design of this little city suggested that there wasn't a hierarchy, but rather a group of people living peacefully as farmers, herdsmen, and traders. While this site is small, the houses are in quite great shape for the amount of time it's been. This little settlement is Europe's most complete Neolithic village, and while it is older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids, it's been called the Scottish Pompeii because of how well preserved it is. No one is exactly sure why the residents of this village abandoned it, which is a really unsettling realization made by researchers. Signs point to perhaps a change in climate that might be responsible for the sudden disappearance, but some signs also point to a storm that might have been the reason those living here had to leave in haste, which is deduced by how all of their belongings were just left behind. In our number 6 spot today we have the scratch marks. When archaeologists opened a tomb they had located dated all the way back to the Qing dynasty, they certainly did not expect to find what was inside. They weren't shocked to find the remains of a person, but what was shocking was the state that she was in. Her skin had turned black like charcoal and she had a terrifying expression on her face with her mouth wide open like she had been screaming. To make matters even worse, apparently there were scratch marks that she had left on the inside. Further research Research showed that it is believed that this woman suffered from a difficult birth and during labor she fainted. Since childbirth used to be way more dangerous of an activity, it is thought that her family believed she had passed away and they then buried her and of course you know the rest. What a horrifying story for everyone involved and to see these signs of her trying to escape is simply just awful. In our number 5 spot today we have the tomb of the sunken skulls. In 2009, archaeologists were excavating the bottom of a prehistoric dry lake bed in Sweden when they began to find the foundations of some sort of stone structure. Yeah, we're talking about a tomb found at the bottom of a lake. Further research began to unearth the usual things like animal bones, stone tools, and that sort of thing, but they also uncovered skulls belonging to 10 people that are believed to have lived 8,000 years ago. They found another 11th 
seventh skull buried deep within the mud, and when they uncovered it, they found that fragments of another one of the skulls had been deliberately lodged inside of this eleventh skull. Almost all of the skulls were jawless and were mounted on stakes. There are a few theories as to why the skulls were here, and some people believe that this site may have been used for secondary burials, but others believe that this tomb belonged to enemies that were killed in combat, and the skulls were there to send a message. Either way, researchers were rightfully shocked when they unearthed this tomb. In our number 4 spot today we have the Ancient Karen. Alright, this really isn't very terrifying. This is probably the item that made me laugh the most while I was researching for this video, and it comes to us from 1750 BC. This is a clay tablet that features a letter written on it. The letter is written in Akkadian cuneiform, and it was sent to the ancient city state Ur, and was made by a customer named Nani, who was sending it to a merchant named Ia Nasir. Basically, this is the oldest known customer complaint letter. Imagine how much work this took. Like, they couldn't just go online to a 24-7 chat and complain, they had to find a big ass stone tablet, carve out the logo sibilic script, and then somehow get it delivered to the merchant. Like that's a next level Karen right there. Basically I guess this merchant guy would travel around selling his copper, and on one particular occasion he agreed to sell some to Nanny. Nanny sent his servant out with some money to pick up this copper, but when he got there it wasn't good enough quality so he didn't end up buying it. So now Nanny was irritated and wanted to complain about the poor copper quality, and he complained that his servant was also treated rudely during the the entire ordeal. He said that at the time of his writing, he had not received any copper, but that he had paid the money for it. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of like the drama of ancient Mesopotamia. In our number three spot today, we have the ancient tomb art. This tomb comes to us from a long time ago, and it was located in the Shamir Heights in northern Israel. The tomb is large, and it is made up of 400 tons of boulders, and it stretches 60 feet wide. This chamber is said to date back 4,000 years, which is a shocking discovery because that means that humans may have been a part of an organized society in this area all those years ago. There are many paintings that have been found inside of this tomb, which made this the first time art had been documented inside one of these chambers in the Middle East, which is incredible, but we just haven't exactly been able to figure out what they depict yet. Inside of the chamber, there were the remains of three people. One of the most fascinating parts of this discovery is that there are these lines carved into the ceilings that are all connected to one arc, but we just don't know what it means. In our number two spot today, we have Heracleon, also known as Thonis to the Egyptians. This was an ancient city that was located near the mouth of the Nile River. Greek legend says that this was the city where Hercules took his first steps into Africa, as well as the place where Paris hid Helen before the Trojan War began. This is all to say that, to legend, this city was super important. But aside from legend, no one knew where this place was or how to find it. In 1999, after five years of searching, archaeologist Frank Gaudio located the ruins of the city underwater as they had been submerged in the ocean. After finding this location, many things were revealed. The most unsettling of all is the discovery of what happened to the ancient city. As it turns out, just over 2,000 years ago, there was either an earthquake, a tsunami, or a combination of the two that hit the city and submerged it underwater. It used to be believed that Thonis and Heracleon were two separate places and that both were located on what is now Egyptian mainland, but neither of those things turned out to be true. Since then, excavations and explorations of the ancient city have taken place, and it was stocked full of some incredibly cool treasures from thousands of years ago. In 2010, a type of ancient Nile river boat was found here, and even just recently in August of 2021, it was announced that wicker baskets that contained fruits of the Duum palm tree as well as grape seeds that date back to the early 4th century BC had been found among the ruins. In our number one spot today, we have the droughts. Ancient drawings and writings were found covering the walls of the Dayu Cave, which is located in central China, and a lot of them detail different droughts and such that were experienced during the time of their writing. According to these drawings, people would come to the cave for either water or to pray for rain in the times of drought. The writings reveal some of the horrors that the people of the time experienced while going through these periods of drought, including severe starvation, social instability, and conflict between government and citizens. 
citizens. While these cave writings show us a difficult time in history, researchers say that the stalagmites that were also found in the cave may show a grim prediction for the future. Since stalagmites are formed by dripping water and they form rings, sort of like how trees do, these rings can give us insights into different things. Based on the patterns of these rings, scientists were able to corroborate the things that the cave writings were saying, but they were also able to make a grim prediction for the future, which is that unfortunately the region may again see one of these catastrophic droughts, this time in the late 2030s. Coming in at number 10 is Jesus' manifestation teachings. In the Bible, there are some pretty interesting things tucked away, like hidden Easter eggs in a video game, and one of these things involves Jesus and his teachings involving manifesting stuff, like making things happen, essentially. But here's a twist. Some folks say that, that these teachings were axed from the Bible because supposedly the Pope had a hand in it not wanting the masses to reach their full potential and potentially dethrone the whole Vatican Empire. So what was this teaching? Apparently, the teachings are about how to pray properly, such that the things that you pray for are actually manifested into existence. Allegedly, this was how Jesus was able to conjure up all those dang miracles. Basically, you're supposed to ask God for things, but ask as though you already have those things. The story goes to the Pope, the big cheese in the Catholic Church didn't want people messing around with manifesting secrets, and he thought it would be too much power for regular folks, or maybe he just wanted to keep it all to himself. At number nine are the false saints. Do you know that some stories about saints might be make-believe than actual reality? Take St. Christopher, for instance, the guy who's supposed to look out for travelers. The Vatican thinks a bunch of the tales about him might actually be fake. Now, they don't exactly hide this. It's just that some die-hard Catholics still want to keep the legend alive, so this church has this mix of fact and fiction in its traditions. They're cool with people still honoring St. Christopher, even if he may not even have ever existed. But it's not just with him, there's other saints too, with stories that might not hold up to history's microscope. So this was not a big secret that the church is holding on to, it's more about some folks holding on to these stories because it's meaningful to them even if they're not totally historically accurate. If you're enjoying the video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing the notification bell. It helps the video get seen by more people, and it's free, so what do you got to lose? At number eight, the removed books. The Bible is a big collection of books, but did you know that there were some stories that didn't make the final cut? These books are called the removed books or the apocrypha. The thing is, these books aren't included in the Bible as we know it today, and some people say that the Pope had a hand in it trying to keep them secret or hidden. These books might have contained different stories or ideas that didn't quite match up with what the church wanted to preach. Let's take one, for example, the Book of Enoch. It's like diving into a whole other world where angels are doing some pretty wild stuff. You got these dudes called the Watchers who decide to leave heaven and come chill on Earth. But then there's drama. They start falling for women and causing chaos by, by making giant hybrid offspring called the Nephilim, Bible fantasy fic. Then there's the Gospel of Thomas, a bunch of sayings by Jesus that aren't in the regular Bible. Think of it as Jesus' greatest hits album, but a secret version. These aren't your typical teachings. They're actually pretty out there and make you scratch your head wondering why they didn't make it into Sunday school. Now, did the Pope try to hide these books? Potentially. The reasons why they got left out are still kind of fuzzy. At number seven is the Bible ban. The Bible is kind of like a treasure map filled with stories and teachings, but it's not always been that easy to crack open. You see, back when dinosaurs roamed, <laughs> just kidding, not that far back, but around the old and medieval days, the Catholic Church had a tight grip on who could read the Bible and who could, you know, understand it. You see, they made sure that every Bible was kept in Latin, a language not spoken by regular folk, so that uneducated people couldn't dive into it themselves. The church liked having the power to explain it all themselves, and they figured that if the people could read the Bible on their own, then they wouldn't need priests or pastors, and the Vatican would be out of the biz, you know? This may have been the beginnings of the inherent distrust between the people and the church, as that's when people began to believe there were hidden codes or messages in the Bible. Kind of like detectives searching for clues, thinking all these hidden gems predict events or unravel big secrets. Over time, things shifted, and now we've got translations in all sorts of languages, making it accessible to more people. Still, the mystery of what might be hidden in those ancient texts keeps people curious. Speaking of which, at number six are the exorcisms. The devil. Yeah, that guy. An old dude once said that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. But in the modern-day Vatican City, the devil is considered alive 
and well. Even the big shots of the Vatican, like Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, took the devil seriously. They did exorcisms, like, you know, getting rid of demons from possessed people. Father Gabriel Amaroth, a big deal exorcist, claims that he casts out loads of demons every year. Now the question here is, how these exorcist dudes are able to perform these rituals as the Bible isn't exactly explicit on the topic. It's led many to believe about a missing book in the Bible that's been removed to prevent public access. The book being specifically about how to handle the possessed people and vanquished demons. Now just like before, it was thought that the exorcist would be useless if everyone's Bible included an exorcism handbook. At number five, the Bible was used to wield power. Throughout history, the Bible hasn't just been about spreading love and peace, as it's been used used to justify mass brutalities and dominions of power. I mean, sure, it's a moral guidebook for many, but it's also been used as a tool by the wicked. The whole idea of forcing people into Christianity through violence or pressure, uh, that's not what Jesus would have wanted, if you believe in that sort of thing. He was more into the love your neighbor vibe. The Bible's been a big deal for rulers and emperors as they use it to justify their actions, sometimes twisting its words to suit their agenda, like using a superhero catchphrase for something totally not heroic. If Jesus were around today, he would certainly not be thrilled about people being forced to convert to Christianity. He'd definitely prefer folks to follow his teachings by choice, not by intimidation. At number four is the pagan symbolism and rituals all hidden throughout the Bible. In history, when Christianity spread, it faced a big question. How do we get people to not just join our new club, but remain devout followers? Well, as it turned out, blending in was key. So they took some things from the pagans, like their symbols and rituals, and gave them a Christian makeover. Imagine this, you're used to celebrating certain holidays or believing in specific symbols, and suddenly someone says, hey, you're a Christian now, but keep doing what you're doing, just call it by a different name kind of like a remix. The church wasn't too fussed about the whole fine print of traditions. They cared more about keeping the cash flowing. So they turned minor gods into saints and mixed old rituals with new Christian ideas. Pretty sneaky. And number three are vain popes. So you know how we often see these majestic portrayal of popes all regal and esteemed? Well, behind those grand paintings and fancy robes, there's a whole side to the story. See, in the medieval times, some popes were quite the extravagant bunch. Picture this, lavish banquets, excessive spending, and a taste for luxuries that would make your head spin. These guys weren't exactly holding back when it came to their lifestyles. They were building extravagant palaces, throwing parties that would make Gatsby blush, and spending money like it was going out of style. Now some of them even had mistresses and children, which for guys supposed to be celibate, kind of raised a couple eyebrows. But here's the thing, the Vatican prefers to keep these stories under wraps. It's like they're trying to keep a lid on the wild tales of their predecessors' excesses. Yet, as much as they try to conceal it, the history books and documents from that time spill the beans. It's like they say, the truth always finds its way out, even if it's been hidden for centuries. And number two, dealings with the mafia. Now this one doesn't have to do with the Bible directly, but I thought I would include it because it just shows how sketchy and susceptible to corruption these organizations are, even if they are the church. See, the unaliving of Pope John I in 1978 was a big mystery. He passed away just 33 days after becoming the Pope, and things seemed really fishy. The official story was that he passed away from a heart attack, but no autopsy was done, leaving doubts. There were whispers about connections between the Vatican and the Mafia. And fast forward to 1982, and its president, Father Paul Markincus, stepped down. The bank had to pay over 200 million due to ties with the Mafia. But here's where it gets interesting. Some people think that there might be hidden messages in the Bible about all of this. Like in Godfather Part 3, there's a scene between the Mafia and the Vatican, and some wonder who was inspired by these real-life events. And coming in at number one is the original OG Bible. The Vatican, where the Pope hangs out, has a lot of old texts, including some ancient Bibles. Now the thing is, these Bibles might have some secrets like hidden messages and stuff that the big guys of the Vatican might not want everyone to know about. The deal with the original Bible is pretty mysterious. Some think that there might be things in there that challenge the church's teachings or even shake up their power. Imagine if there were some wild ideas in there that made people question what they've been told for centuries, which could be a pretty big deal. But there's no solid proof that the Vatican is trying to hide away the original Bible. Some folks think that they might because, well, old secrets can be pretty juicy. But until we get a closer look at these original texts, it's all speculation and mystery. <laughs> Thank you.